Welcome to Holy Fucking Science. This is Hank Green. Uh, this is the podcast where four friends, we get together, uh, we all make content at uh, youtube.com slash scishow. We get together and we bring each other some science and an attempt to make someone else in the room say, Holy, Holy fucking, fucking science. science. Today we have with us Sari Riley. Sari is a writer for SciShow, editor, uh, one of our staff people who does, does the editorial, makes all the words that come out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. How are you doing? I'm good. Good? Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for coming. We have Michael Aranda, one of the SciShow hosts, and doing the guy's sound design for SciShow and all of our enterprises here. So I really must big... say that the uh, the intro music we just heard was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's uh, wearing a lot of coats right now, so if you ever hear anything rustling around, that's Michael. He's got two different coats on. Yeah. You're going to be very warm. I'm Hank. I host SciShow and started SciShow. We also have Caitlin Hoffmeister, the uh, producer of SciShow. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Great. Good. I'm glad that everybody's here. Uh, last time, last time we started, uh, and I like this rule. Uh, we ha- had the person who ate the least recently go first. It's definitely not me because I had a peanut butter cup walking in here. It was awesome. When when did you last eat, Michael? Uh, about twelve thirty. You never eat, Sari. That's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> I eat constantly. <laughs> I probably ate at like two. Okay. See, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small I, snack. I also ate, I think, at twelve thirty. Okay. It had to mean it was before one. Well, I'm gonna let Caitlin go first because okay. you went first last time. You were here. Is that true? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Um, what we, what do you so got for us? Our what? theme today is physics because yeah, you had physics. a physics idea that you wanted to talk about. I did. Which I, I we defined, don't know what it is. I defined the theme entirely yeah. by the the cool thing I read on the internet. That's awesome. That's that's how I navigate my life. So yeah, um, but I love I love is not the right word, but I'm fascinated by the Manhattan Project. Sure, yeah. And I feel like if we're gonna talk about physics, we should talk about like nuclear explosions. Mm-hmm. Um, but what is so cool and terrifying and horrible and amazing about the Manhattan Project is not uranium, which a little boy. That bomb was uranium. Mm -hmm. But plutonium is the one that they actually had to test and, like, figure out. Uranium, they, like, had a good handle on it. They made this one bomb. They're like, that'll work. We don't even have to test it. But plutonium's, like... But they, but they were like, we don't have we don't have enough. We want a yeah. different way to make bombs. Yeah, just and we want case. a scarier, weirder one. Yeah, and okay. so... And to me, that's how I see it. The one that, uh, that Doc Brown was trying to get in the parking lot when he was shot by the Syrians? I think so. Wasn't it's, I was what? just gonna say, Libyans. I was like, man, Sorry. that movie really saw into the future. <laughs> they were like blaming things Thanks, on Lou. Syrians. Lou was shouting from the back. He's, he's on camera. He's like, it's the Libyans. Uh, just to be clear. Yeah. So yeah, plutonium makes sci-fi happen. It it's makes terrifying. what happen? Sci-fi. Okay. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, um, and so I want to talk about plutonium and the demon core, which yeah. is the scariest thing ever it's and it's just a lump just of like, metal yes it's a lump of metal and like the so obviously an atomic bomb works because a chain reaction mm-hmm. is set off and is sustainable like with uranium like they shoot uranium at more uranium mm-hmm. and that does it but with plutonium it's like i guess this is the same plutonium it's just like it's Five percent. It's like ninety-five percent on its way to being critical mass, where it can just do just it all on its own. Do it all on its own, and then it's like all the experiments that are done are figuring out how close you can get to that and where you can get to that like trigger point where it hits critical mass. And so the demon core is. This is something that was going to be in the third atom bomb that ended World War II, um, but Japan was like surrendered, and then they didn't do any. They didn't Good. drop another bomb. But the, that, the works of that next potential bomb still went on to kill people. And so um, after World so, War II so, ended... So, the, so after World War II ended, there's this bomb that they ended up not using, but it still killed people? Yes, because they were still doing experiments. Like, these people still had jobs, and they were trying to... So they were working on it... Um, 
preparing it, and then they were going to drop it on August 19th, 1945, but then Japan surrendered on August 15th. I didn't realize so that it was actually days. going to be a thing that was going to get you four days. Yeah. Wow. So they were still working on it, and then they continued to like experiment with it because they were like, I guess they, were, I don't know why, but they were like, Well, we got this thing. We got this thing. Let's figure it out. It cost so, a lot of money to make. Yes, but then it cost so. Ugh, there's like haunting pictures of the two physicists who who died pretty quickly. But um, so it's called the Demon Core because two accidents happened, and the first one was August 21st, 1945, when Harry. Dalian, Daglian, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Um, he was 24. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you forget how young how all young, these scientists were. So young. Yeah. What he was doing is he was arranging neutron reflectors and playing, playing, experimenting with, with those and um, figuring out how close they could get. But he, he had it set up, but he, um, and they're these tungsten carbide bricks and you move them around manually. Um, and so... He accidentally dropped one for a fraction of a second and set it off, pulled it off, and, like, but, oh, I wanted to, like, this is audio, but I wanted to, like, hand you something, Michael, and then, like, you could go like that. Just, like, tap it. Yeah, it's just, like, it, it's, like, like drop you do it, something pick that it right back fast. Up. Yeah, and, um, and that was enough radiation to, poisoning. To, 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 like, the thing that was blocking... The radiation? No, or it set off the... It set off a chain reaction. It set off the chain reaction, and he pulled it off and stopped it. Oh. Um, and so he got enough radiation in that fraction of a second that he got acute radiation poisoning and died. But, but how long did it, like, how long does that take? 25 days. Oh, my God. Isn't that horrible? So it's like your blood mm -hmm. just starts breaking down. Like, you're, there's pictures of his, his hand immediately started. Mm-hmm. Breaking down like your DNA just disintegrates yeah. and turns on you. Um, but interestingly, so he was like, they talk about how he was alone. He was working alone, but it's a high security um, protected place. And so there's a security guard there who was 29 and he was about three or four meters away. And he, you could say survived, but 33 years later when he was 62, he died of acute myo, myelogenous leukemia. Oh, okay. So he so did. He probably did die. Yeah. Of the result of that yes, death. Yes, yeah. And so, and that's like if you, like, lots of people in Japan who mm -hmm. survived the atomic bombs, like, ended that's up dying in, of leukemia much later. Um, and so the second incident was a little less than a year later. Um, where Louis Slotten, or Louis Slotten, I'm not sure how to pronounce his first name, he was a 35-year-old physicist, and he was leaving Los Alamos, and he was training the guy who was going to replace him, and to do um, Alvin Graves, who was going to do the bikini atoll tests. Mm -hmm. um, atoll, bikini atoll sure, tests. Um, and so, but uh, Louis Slotten was kind of like wild card, and he had this like trick of like, it was the same, the same core, um, and you had to manually place half spheres of beryllium around it to use as neutron reflectors instead of the tungsten carbide. And so he had this trick, and if it closed completely, it would set off the chain reaction. So he and you had to do it by hand, but he would use a screwdriver to get it as close as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, and Enrico Fermi is quoted as being like, if you keep doing that, you'll be dead within a year. Like, don't do that. Um, but he was showing Alvin Graves how to do this trick that he had. And there were, I think, six people. There were eight. I mean, if, it, I feel like you're a 35-year-old scientist and Enrico Fermi is like, don't do that. You don't do that. No, yeah. Do, stop yeah. doing that thing. Yeah. He's a smart guy. Yeah. And it's just like, it seems like it's a little thing that you interact with every day. And so I can see, like, yeah. it's your day job or whatever, but it's, like, they're so dangerous. And so he was showing, I think there were eight people in the room, and um, he was so close to it and showing Alvin Graves. Alvin Graves was looking over his shoulder, and he just, the screwdriver slipped, and it went down, and he flicked it off and flicked it onto the floor, like, that fast. And in that half second, though, there's reports that it's just like a blue light and warmth just like came out and he flicked it off and it was over. And because Alvin Graves was peeking over his shoulder, 
Alvin Graves was pretty much shielded, mm-hmm. and Louis Slotin took all the radiation, and he died within nine days. Well, honestly, if you're gonna if you're gonna get radiation sickness, probably well. faster, faster is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a pill for this? Not one that makes me better, but one that just makes me dead. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'll take it, that. Yeah, but this is never like, like. It had never happened to an American before. You know, there wasn't, they were, they were like, well, it's like, what's going to happen? You know, like, mm-hmm. they don't know, like, so oh, wanted, you're done. They Let's... wanted to see the. I kind of think so. Or I think they held out hope, you know, yeah, they maybe, didn't yeah. know if, if yeah. like, hey, we should just kill him because this is awful. We know he's dead. Um, but, <laughs> but so, yeah, he, he died nine it's days not later. not usually how we do things. Yeah. Oh, I mean, but yeah, I guess in the 40s, we didn't have like, um. What's the death with dignity after you are radiation? Yeah. <laughs> um, but there was another physicist in the room. So there were s- seven other physicists in the room, um, who, including those two. Um, and they, some didn't want to be studied. I think one didn't want to be studied. One died in the Korean War. Um, and some of them lived for plenty of long time. But um, Marion Edward Sislicki? Sislicki? Sure, yeah, yeah. These are Doesn't awesome matter. names. Who cares? Yeah, but um, he died. He was 23 at the time of the incident, and he died 19 years later of, of leukemia. leukemia. So he probably died, like, because that's a pretty young time. Mm-hmm. Young. And so um, it's just crazy. Like, physics, like, yeah, I was like, I what just, do I know about physics? But I just I was, love like, that. I love so that powerful. you just, like, have this lump of metal. It's a paperweight. Like, yeah. for most of its time. And it's and fine then, mm-hmm. until until you do something, reflect some neutrons back at it, and it's like, I'm going to go critical now. Yeah. And... And irradiate you to death. Yeah. I I find I also find the Manhattan Project fascinating because it's a bunch of like twenty and thirty year yes. olds working on you know this like unthinkable inventing new science yeah, like, and like like, like leveling up of science. Yeah. Where it's like like it, this will never happen again. Where we le- like we realized something about the universe, and we were like, "Oh, what if we did this?" Right. And you can create, you know, nuclear submarines. You can create bombs. You can create power plants, uh, and it, it, like this massive amount of energy that was hiding in this place that we didn't know to look for it. And it's just these kids, from my perspective. And I'm sure they're there, like partying and getting drunk. Like you don't think about it that way, but like, the, like how many? What do you think their condom budget well, was? Oh, to, like, w- well, I mean, a lot of them were married because they got married young then. But like, they married but, people can use condoms too. That's true. <laughs> I guess if you're working on a nuclear yeah. like bomb, maybe you don't want to have kids. Oh, they did actually. Like some women got rearranged because they got pregnant, and they were, or they were worried that they would be pregnant, or they would worried right, they would be and barren. Working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's this one woman. I think it's like Lily. Holrig is like she was a chemist on the project and she's quoted she like they tried to kick her out of some project and she was like uh my reproductive organs are on the inside i would be worried about all of you (laughs) (laughs) they were like "Ooh," but yeah and then so the my final thing to say about the demon court is that like it was never used that when they realized like how powerful it was and they kept like moving it back in in the testing schedule and then eventually they just melted it down and used it for something else so it's crazy that something so powerful yeah could then just be well i, le- I kind of like the idea that they, they would have put it in a museum somewhere but it probably just got Too used scary, as nuclear maybe. fuel yeah 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 pro- like probably was a was a you know a few thousand kilowatts of electricity yeah got used in some ways somehow. it it reminds me of the chernobyl thing yeah uh which I did this, there was a, a Reddit post that had like hundreds of pictures from their whole Chernobyl thing and each one had a, a caption underneath that went into pretty deep detail about the whole story. And I had heard of it, but never done such a, like a deep dive into it. Mm-hmm. And it's the same kind of thing where sometimes it just feels like the way that humans play with parts of the universe is like a kid with a gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially in those first moments when we don't really know what we're doing, which is why I like artificial intelligence right now is a little scary, and a lot of people are talking about like, I don't know, man. Let's be a little careful. Have you seen RoboCop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't doesn't work out real well with Dave and Hal. Uh, I uh, I am of the opinion 
that the robot wars will be fought by humans, but controlled by artificial intelligences. Mm. That's the sci-fi novel I think we're going to end up in. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I feel like Michael Ronda's turn is next. <laughs> oh. Uh, um, yeah. Well, in my search for a topic that I felt would make everybody say, holy fucking science, mm -hmm. I ended up with something that I think is just going to make people go, huh. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Don't sell yourself short. Um, the reason being, it, it made me go, huh. Okay. Um, well, you, I mean, you're not known for your strong emotions, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> um, so, at CERN, yep. where they have the Large Hadron Collider, um, there is a project called the uh, Baryon Anti Baryon Symmetry Experiment, mm. or BASE. Uh, and at this experiment location, they have a 1.2 liter cylinder made of copper that they use to hold uh, antiprotons. Um, they get like, like what, a, do you know how many of them they get in there at a time? Because it can't be a lot. It, I don't think it's a lot because uh, antiprotons are the rarest kind of particles in the universe. And the purpose of the base experiment is to take uh, antiprotons and protons and study both of them and compare the ways in which they are different from each other mm -hmm. and use that to help shed some light on how physics works beyond the understanding of the standard model. Um, so they, they take this little cylinder and they lower the pressure in it as much as they can mechanically and then they use liquid hydrogen to cool it even further to uh, 6 Kelvin, which is yep. negative 267 degrees Celsius. And the pressure inside that thing is less than that of interstellar space. Um, there was a Reddit user, MFB Dash, uh, who calculated that that comes to about 2 to the power, uh, or 2 times 10 to the power of negative 16. Um, What's uh, Pascal's? Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a number. Yes. <laughs> it's so small it doesn't have a my unit. My physics teacher, my physics teacher in high school, would be like, "Ah, S P O H S is what it is." If you leave the units off, units off, it's steaming piles of horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I mean, I like when people do that. I'm just like, I like. It's like somebody begins, a, like. A, a musical arc and then doesn't finish it, I'm just like, you have to say the units or I'm going to freak out. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be sitting here for the rest of the day being like, oh, God, that was Cubits. annoying. <laughs> <laughs> cubits. Yeah, I'll just, just put cubits on there. Uh, Link of a human forearm. <laughs> so in November of 2015, they captured a bunch of antiprotons in this cylinder um, and then... As of last November, so in 2016 sometime, they set a couple records. One for uh, containing antimatter for the longest amount of time that we've ever contained antimatter for a full year. Mm. Oh, and uh, that cor corresponded with the, the achievement of they contained just any charged particle period for the longest length of time that we ever had hmm. a year. Um, yeah, like and, one individual particle staying in one place. Yeah, and that made me go, huh. Yeah. Yeah. I also would have thought that that maybe would have happened before. What but was like the, oh, keeping yeah. a charged particle in one place and not having it react with something. Like not having it join up with some electrons, not having it like... Yeah, um, they... There was a discussion on one of the articles that I was reading about it where someone was asking like how long could a anti-proton last like mm -hmm. if uh you just left it in the container forever and it's they said that if an antiproton lasts the same amount of time that a regular proton can then we're talking like as long yeah. as the the containment unit stays powered trillions of billions of billions of years yeah so pretty stable particles forever protons. <laughs> um i did learn an interesting thing about how they 
contain these particles when they're using them to in a, in a beam in the Hadron Collider to shoot them along the the path. Um, I think it's called a Paul. Did I write it down? A Paul trap is how they contain the particles within the beam. Mm-hmm. And if you imagine a uh, a saddle on a horse, um, on one axis it's concave front mm-hmm. to back. On another axis, left to right, it's convex. So if you place a marble on the top of that saddle, it won't roll off the front or the back of the saddle, it'll roll off one of the sides. Mm-hmm. Um, so this Paul trap uses uh, a magnetic field to form that sort of shape around the the proton that they're, or whatever particle that they're trying to keep in one place, and then that field, like if you, if you imagine the, the uh, saddle spinning, it spins around that particle. If it spins too slowly, it'll still just roll off the sides, and if it spins too quickly, the particle can sort of like catch on the saddle and get flung yeah. out. Um, but at just the right speed, it keeps it contained within that mm-hmm. uh, concave part of the field. Why right. wouldn't they just make a concave Field. Like a, Why make like it a tunnel, like a like a like, like a slide. A, yeah. At a water park. I don't know. I'm sure there's good reasons. Probably. I'm not a nuclear physicist. Yeah. Proton rodeo Nor- rules. Proton rodeo. Yeah. Maybe um, it's like easier to make the magnetic field in a saddle shape. I don't yeah. know enough about like, like this is like magic to me in my yeah. brain because totally. I yeah. I like want physical something, but the idea that you can just like mm, magnetism and like let's just spin it <laughs> like an object. Fucking magnet. Yeah. How do they work? <laughs> They're just gonna go. Yeah. <laughs> I know that they can use both magnetic or electric fields to do this kind of harnessing of, of mm-hmm. particles. Um, and the, the kind of trap that they use in the, that cylinder thing I was talking about, um, they have to use both kinds. There's uh, a magnetic field that's, I don't remember which direction's which, but one of them is holding the particles in uh, from side to side, and the other kind of field is holding them in from going out the tops of this mm-hmm. cylinder. Um, okay, but the, yeah. the video that I watched where there was a, a woman showing how this Paul trap works, and she had a, a small one just on her desk, and she was using little bits of pollen. She just put the pollen in there and then turns the thing on, and they, they float as the, the electric field in that thing holds them in place. I want a little pollen levitator. Just, like, <laughs> levitate things. Look at my magnetic field and my objects. There's a question in the chat here. Uh, couldn't something as simple as a capacitor hold a charge in place for longer? You know, Rocky Bullwinkle? The person's name? I don't know. I feel I feel like the like the a capacitor might hold a charged particle that like comes in and goes out, but like more are always replacing it, but I don't know. Um I kind of want to go next because my thing is also about particle accelerators. So if, as long as Sarah is not gonna be mad at me. Mine it relates to antimatter, but uh, that can come later Jeez. too. Wow, we all good job. yeah, we, did we, all, a good job. we all went with yeah, we kind of went with uh, similar things here. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad I don't think anybody's are, are, are totally overlapping. But I don't think so. So what? So what would happen if you if there's so there's a particle accelerator? It's moving these particles along at like literally like almost the speed of light. A bunch of them, uh, and then they smash into each other and they do stuff and they study with the stuff that they do. What happens if you, like, just stand in front of it? Uh, do you turn into the Flash? Like, in the show on television called The Flash? Or, like, what would you think would happen? If you stood in the beam of a particle accelerator? I feel like bad things is the instinct. So, uh, but I feel like that's, bad things. But that's the intuitive? Or, well, I'm like, I, I don't, don't feel obvious. I, don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel I, like... There are so many particles flying through me at any given time anyway. No, no, no. These are different particles. These are heavy, big particles moving very fast. But would they like neutrinos your whole are body? going through, but neutrinos don't interact with mass. Or would just part of you be the flash? <laughs> There's also the thing that like a lot of your body is empty space just because atoms sure, aren't sure. very packed close together, but yeah, the fact but that like they're charged. A particle accelerator, it, they're yeah. like intentionally smashing particles yeah. into particles and yeah. things happen. Like energy is released. So the instinct that something bad happens yeah. is the correct instinct. A bad thing happens. But interestingly, I have the incorrect instinct. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess. like I'll be fine. Yeah, don't stand in a particle accelerator beam. <laughs> so it it does seem a little bit like you know maybe like I'm, we're not sure like what what exactly would happen. 
Like, you're not going to test it. You're not going to, like, throw somebody's head into a particle accelerator to see what happens. I mean, you could, like, except, go get a steak or something. Except. Yeah, like a pig head. We did. <laughs> a human head? What? Uh, not on purpose. <gasps> but a man oh, at the no. U-70 synchrotron, which is, a part, which is a proton accelerator in Germany, the most power, not Germany, in Russia. I don't know, those two countries. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we go to war with them. Uh, is the thing they have in Germany common. Germany <laughs> used to be called Prussia. Yeah, yeah. that must be it. That's <laughs> the, so it's the biggest particle accelerator in Russia. Uh, it was the biggest particle accelerator in the world when it was built in uh, in the sixties, nineteen sixty seven, and it was uh, a, a part in it was broken, and a man and a man named Anatoly Bergo, B- Bugorsky. Because uh, he's, he's Russian, uh, <laughs> leaned into the particle accelerator beam to try and fix the thing that was broken, but it wasn't so broken that the particle accelerator had stopped accelerating particles. And he was shot in the brain by a proton beam going near the speed of light. It went in, uh, like, right to the, to the right of his nostril, and it came out in the back of his head, uh, sort of above his ear. So it went through part of his brain, um, oh God! It, it, he said at the moment that it happened. <gasps> wait, he, wait. So he lived. He lived. Well, see, as as soon as you said that it had happened, I was like, then probably nothing super bad happened because I imagine I would have heard of this. <laughs> yeah. Unless the next line was, he said at the moment that it happened, he went. <laughs> at the moment it happened, he said, "Ow!" <laughs> and that was it. So that's all we know. It hurts. No, in fact, he said it did not hurt at all. But he saw a light as bright as a thousand suns because it, it passed sort of like close by his optic nerve. Huh. So his optic nerve was activated. But he didn't, he didn't experience any immediate negative consequences. But then the entry and exit point developed over time, like a couple days later, developed burn wounds. All of the hair fell out of just the spot above his ear hmm. where it went in. So all of his hair fell out just in that one spot. And then... Uh, he start like he lost hearing in his what? right ear, and it sounded like a constant loud noise that happened for the rest of his life. And then over the next few years, he lost the ability to control that side of his face, what? like not immediately, but over a long period of time. He also uh, experienced some cognitive problems, like he would tire more easily when doing hard mental tasks but, but he did go on he did go on to finish his phd and he continued working uh, and and uh, is a st- is still a scientist he's still a working russian scientist who just happened to be struck by a, f- a proton beam in the brain uh, and it like it went all the way through so like it ionized throughout his entire head so it like basically it's a little bit like being like being Phineas Gage except instead of a, a rod you know two inches in diameter going through your brain. It was like a beam, just like an imperceptibly skinny rod shooting yeah. through your brain. Hmm. So amazingly enough, he was pretty much okay, uh, though he did suffer. So it's some serious ionizing radiation and like he could die of a number of things that, that would be caused by this, but he uh, was okay. So do they just think the radiation it's irradiated like, those cells in that yeah. region and then it like slowly killed them off or something right. to make the effects. Possibly, yeah. Well, that's what that's what blows me about it's the sort of, demon it's sort of core like we thing because really... you could just like touch it and then you're like, yeah, I'm fine, but then no, you're not fine. Right, well, that's the thing about radiation is yeah. like it can be, uh, like it can do the damage then your cells don't know the damage was done for a while. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. So yes, Crazy. a man was shot in the brain with a particle accelerator, which is the whole reason I wanted to do physics this episode. <laughs> Part of me was hoping, not for his sake, that his brain would like turn to mush or something like that. Like, 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 like goop, like, like gelatinous. Just whole, yeah, yeah, just like, just like just bloop, like yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, yeah, like something. Oh yeah, that's, you know, he got hit with. I feel like that would be yeah. a good sci-fi, yeah. like fake science thing. It's like, bzz. Proton yeah. beam, just yeah. your goop. <laughs> well, you're yeah, I mean, now. it's sort of amazing that we know. Yeah. Uh, but don't yeah. do that. No. If you've, if you're ever, if you ever have the opportunity to get shot in the brain with a particle accelerator, don't. Well, and it's interesting because it's brain. So, like, do you, I wonder if he'd stuck his hand? 
Do you think? I was just thinking the same thing because yeah. Yeah. a lot of the brain can't repair itself the same way that like skin can. Right. Well, so. the, yeah. Immediately, like his, he also like had blood vessel damage, so like his face got really swelled up, and he like looked really weird. There's actually a picture of him somewhere. Where is it? Goopy and purple. <laughs> yeah, so there's this picture of him, and you could like see the the burn on his scalp. And then, so if you want to Google this, you could just Google dude sticks his head in a particle accelerator, uh, and his like cheek is super full of fluid. And but yeah, it does look like the Phineas Gage like yeah explanation totally like that angle. right through yeah. that part of your brain. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So it did a bunch of, did a bunch of damage, but uh, he's, he's doing still okay. alive. Wow. Yeah. So. Like administratively at this location, where they like, hmm, maybe we should maybe uh, maybe there maybe there should be some safety protocols yeah. going on. They here. had to change their calendar like zero days since somebody <laughs> like stuck their head in front of them. Yeah, that's that's uh, never a good day. Um, uh, Bugorski continued to work in science and held uh, the post of coordinator of physics experiments because the Soviet Union's policy of maintaining secrecy on nuclear power related issues. He didn't speak about the accident for over a decade. He continued going to the Moscow Radiation Clinic twice a year for examinations and to meet with other nuclear accident victims. He he remained a poster boy for Soviet and Russian radiation medicine. In 1996, he applied unsuccessfully for a disabled status to receive uh, free his epilepsy medication. (laughs) <laughs> oh my and god. Unsuccessful? They Unsuc- give it to oh him for god, free? you gotta love the Russians. Oh. They're like, well, we realized that maybe we should have built like some safety protocols in so that you couldn't shoot yourself in the brain with uh but but really it was your fault. I think to to be fair, I mean protons. There are, are probably everywhere. plenty of instances of the US government not being the nicest to people that uh made certain sacrifices. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Are we gonna be like? Are we gonna be like a pro-Putin podcast now? Is that what's happening, Michael? No, I just think uh, it's a, an unfortunate reality of governments. Yeah, I guess uh, they have a son. He has a son, Peter. Conceived before or after? I don't know. It doesn't say. Mm. He's married to Vera. Vera Nikolaevna. <laughs> <laughs> Your Russian's getting really good. <laughs> uh, it and uh, also. The, the see also section of his Wikipedia page is one proton therapy, which is using this to kill cancer, and two Phineas Gage. Oh man! So. <laughs> oh god! Seventy six giga electron volts. He saw a flash brighter than a thousand suns, but did not feel any pain. Hmm. Anatoly Bergorsky. Well, well, I'll give that a holy fucking science, yeah, but you guys that don't is have a to. Holy science. <laughs> I think I think my reactions are also muted to things. My what is essentially a what a, a what? Yeah, I feel like yeah, we're also talking about like kind of sad. Yeah, things. Right, that's today. what somebody said yeah. today. That somebody somebody yeah. said, uh, oh, it's a comedy podcast about radiation poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's not sad. It's weird Yay, though. Uh, on you then. And I hope I hope I explain it right. Mine is also about antimatter, uh, so it relates to Michael's, kind of. And nobody dies. And nobody dies in it. Uh, there are a lot of people involved, but nobody dies, and many of them are still alive today and researching away. Okay, good. I'm real, I was really nervous. <laughs> like, nobody dies, but they are all dead or something. Yeah. Like. Um, so it's really easy for people to think of matter and antimatter as opposites. Like, that's how... A lot mm-hmm. of people do. For every regular hydrogen atom, which is an electron bound to a proton, there's an anti-hydrogen atom, which is a anti-electron, which we call positrons, bound to an anti-proton. Um, and this is called something called charge parity symmetry, where uh, the charge conjugation switches. So something negative goes to something positive. And then the parity is a space change that switches. So if electrons are moving with a positive velocity from left to right, they'll change directions mm. um, in, in antimatter. Um, Does that, do electrons move in a particular direction? All uh, of the, like, do they, do they have a preference? I don't know enough about it. I think the electron cloud model is like they jump around randomly, right. but yeah. I think they have some velocity that can be described yes, with the direction. This is a weird thing about, about Subatomic particles. Yeah, sub- and photons too. There's a lot like, of weird subatomic particles in here. And I how do you have there. direction <laughs> if you are also just a statistical probability? I'm leaving. Yeah, that's yeah. sort of how I feel about 
about quantum mechanics. Mm. Mostly, mostly I like, I'm leaving, is my reaction <laughs> to whenever somebody wants to tell me about particle wave duality. Well, we're going to talk a lot about quantum mechanics. Okay. And we're going to talk I'm about it in a lot of metaphor, so we can hopefully <laughs> get it right. Um, and so we even did a SciShow News recently. Uh, I don't know how recently it will be for the podcast, but there is one about how anti-hydrogen emitted the same light spectrum as a hydrogen. So it seems like they act similarly and they're uh, symmetrical based on that experiment. Mm -hmm. But if matter and antimatter were exactly the opposite of each other, nothing would exist in the universe. Mm. Shut up. Mm. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I feel like we just entered into like a riddle. This, uh, I think, it is related to what that experiment was that my thing was about because they were talking about how uh, their antimatter that they're trying to contain in this thing, um, the reason that they have to get the, the pressure so low in there to get a almost perfect vacuum is because any time any regular matter right. happens to go through, it'll annihilate each other. And so, I don't remember what the measurement was. It's something like, uh, they get the pressure down to three particles per s cubic centimeter in that thing. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty low pressure. Yeah, so, so yeah, it is exactly that. Uh, based on, because when matter and antimatter come into contact, uh, they explode into energy and light. Mm -hmm. And so, according to the current Big Bang models, there is an equal amount of matter and antimatter created. Um, and we know some of them like collided and exploded because that's why there's background radiation in the uh -huh. universe, the 2.7 Kelvin radiation. Uh, but there's still a lot more matter than antimatter in the universe, and that's like a really big mystery for physicists. And the fact that that exists um, made a couple people say, well, one of our assumptions is probably wrong about the standard uh, particle model and the Big Bang model. And it's probably that matter and antimatter aren't exact opposites. That there are cases in which the rules of physics work differently, completely differently, for matter and antimatter. Okay. And those are called uh, violations in CP symmetry, or CP violations. Okay. So, matter. Mm-hmm. How do we... But shouldn't there still be antimatter out there then? Or did it annihilate itself? You just keep talking. Yeah, Why I'll am keep, I talking? <laughs> we'll, we'll, get, we'll circle back around. Okay. Uh, so this is the way uh, she explained CP violation to me. Um, and it was if you took the universe and tried to create a mirror version mm -hmm. of it, uh, you flipped the charge and the parity of all the particles, uh, basically like a movie of an antimatter universe, would it look the same or would it look different? And with particles like hydrogen, we think, then it would look the exact same. But there are some instances, like in 1964, they found the first instances of this. Um, it's kaons or k mesons, which are a quark and an anti-quark combined. That's that particle. Um, they decay in different ways such that that CP violates... So if you... Um, if you reversed it, if you created an opposite version of them and played the movie of the universe, it would be different than if you just like played it in our reality, mm -hmm. where everything's normal. Because of the way the, they break apart and they create matter and antimatter and they fly in weird directions. That's so cool. And the, like, they just operate under several different laws of physics that we don't quite know how to explain. Right. Well, uh, so, so this is a quark and an anti-quark. Yes. And so say that we're talking about a quark and an anti-quark. In this situation, this mirror universe, you're talking about anti-quark and a quark. Yeah. But like of the opposite kind. Yeah, yeah, but of the opposite kind. I think okay. it's like a strange quark and a down quark or right. something like that. Okay. And then if you swap those, then they'll like fly in different directions. Uh, and they found mo uh, more kind of instances of this where it's like there's this one very particular particle like a B meson I think is another one where it flies apart in a slightly different way because it's made of matter and antimatter but none of this was enough to prove that we haven't gotten annihilated like none of this is explained right. how so so much matter remained and how so much antimatter seems to be missing um, and so one of the main theories uh, to try and explain this is 
neutrinos, which are very, very small. They don't have, uh, have very little mass, and we like are learning more about them as they go. I think the most interesting one for me was if neutrinos and antineutrinos were actually the same particle. So there aren't two versions of neutrinos okay. that they just exist as like one particle and antiparticle and can flip between mm. the different laws of physics. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because neutrinos are the ones that are just like flying through you all the time and don't really interact with matter very much. Yeah. But they have some mass, mm -hmm. but a very small amount. Yeah. And like to like to even to even find them, they have these like giant tanks of underground water where there's like one neutrino interaction every three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they use like radiation to even tell that they exist. I think yeah. that's like the Cherenkov radiation where they, mm -hmm. they like s shoot pot particles through and then if they see blue light glowing, then that means that a neutrino's there, yeah. but they don't actually see them at all. Um, so, yeah. That means that a neutrino is there, not an anti-neutrino. Yeah, or, or they could be the same thing. And an that's like the one of the ways that people are looking for CP violation to explain why there's so, so much, much matter. matter. Because if neutrinos are their own antiparticles, then we might just be miscounting the number of antimatter in the universe mm. because we're considering all we're neutrinos are matter. It. Yeah, but they could be doubled up. Um, or they can, yeah, somehow bleed into each other, either like switch the laws of physics that they operate by um, in a way that violates CP or can our matter universe and the an mirror antimatter universe somehow like cross over, which seems like the weirdest. Alice in Wonderland style. Yeah, like so is there. So there's like there's like an anti universe sort of occupying the same space as our universe, I and we just can't think see so. it. So I don't know, Ew. made of like. I like it. I'm into it. It could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's touching me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like right like, now. Those are my space. Are, are they watching us? Yeah. <sighs> Probably not. Yeah, so I, I hope I explained well, that fairly right, but it was just like it was very I, uh, weird. I, the, this this idea that like like okay, we got a pretty good grasp on how the universe works, but according to our current understanding, we shouldn't exist. We're wrong. Mm -hmm. We're wrong. Yeah. Uh, like I love I love that. I, <laughs> I also hate it. But um, but I it makes me think of that that theory that has some that has some backing in uh, in and I don't know like how much, but like that. Uh, that universes have been trying themselves out for a long time yeah. and kind of like uh, like it, almost in a sense of, of biological evolution where like, new, like universes where certain things happen tend to stick around longer or uh, tend to create more chances for universes to exist or something like that. The, the one that I've heard is that that like there's sort of an evolution of universes towards universes where more black holes can happen. Why? Look. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't. I don't have any fucking idea. Like, as to what? Uh, but, uh, but I like the idea that like these tiny, tiny little tweaks to like this the, the model of physics can have this gigantic consequence of of instead of having a universe that just upon the Big Bang happening annihilated itself completely, you have this shit podcasts and <laughs> humans and like cats. And pulsars and all that stuff. This kind of thing makes me think about what kind of technology will exist in the future. Because right now all of our technology exists because we have this level of understanding of how our universe works and how to manipulate it. Um, but if we reach a point where we do actually understand all of these things, what does that enable us to do? Oh, wow. What a... What an optimistic way of looking at that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm like, oh, I just love that like the deeper we go, the more we don't understand. And I like have no hope of us ever being like, solved it, you know, mm -hmm. like. Right, well, yeah, I kind of feel, I kind of feel like the more you understand, the more questions you have. Yeah. Like that has been, the, that, that has been totally, the case so I, far. Yeah, but also that like, yeah, there are questions out there that we don't even know exist. I think it's, it's more like, I feel like standing in the middle of an infinite Minecraft world or something, <laughs> and there's an area that we can see, but we don't know how to get there. And I know that when we get there, there's just gonna be more stuff that we can see and not yet get to, but 
<laughs> yeah, sure, use it. Like, uh, why, why does it have to be Minecraft? Why can't it just be the world? Why right? can't it just be a normal... Uh, because, Minecraft. you know, Minecraft is an infinitely generating right, okay. thing. Yeah. Right. I, was, okay. I watched Hidden Figures <laughs> yesterday, and uh, I just, like, the Mercury 7 just makes me so weepy. I'm like, <laughs> they're like, we're already on the moon. We just have to figure out how to get there. Yeah, and that's, right. like... Your Minecraft explanation, I'm like, oh god, <laughs> so good, so amazing. <laughs> Does the Minecraft talk always makes people yeah. cry yeah, a little bit? Yeah, this is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like, like they discovered this like 50 years ago, like right. 1964. Physicists were like, huh, maybe antimatter and matter aren't opposites, but like we named them wrong. <laughs> yeah, and. And like I found it out 48 hours ago or like 24 mm -hmm. hours ago. And that's yep. just ridiculous. The way that we talk about it. Well, my, there's too yeah, many things to know, too, There's Sarah. so many too. I just want to know all of them though. That is, that is, that is the right way yeah. to feel. Because I need you feeling that way <laughs> in your job. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Um, did anybody that's bring, so cool. I, I said once upon a time that I wanted to end every episode with a really dumb thing that we used to think about the world. Does well, we any, used to think. The antimatter was the opposite of matter. <laughs> I don't think that's ridiculous. The door. That's so dumb. It does. It does no. look as if it is that way. It is apparently it's that way with hydrogens, but not with their component quark parts. Kind of. Possibly. Um, I've got one. Yeah. Okay. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do my homework for that. There was a. Uh, so, it's it's always it's always going to be, Aristotle with me, but uh, so there was a belief in Aristotle's time. <laughs> That Aristotle subscribed to, that uh, unlike most fishes, can I can I, have I told you this before? It's commonly like they are pretty sure that Aristotle had a lisp, uh -huh. and so I always, whenever anybody talks about Aristotle, I imagine them saying Aristotle, <laughs> and that like they're saying like this is a belief that Aristotle subscribed to, and I um I just get so excited, and I just so sorry. That's why I'm just like subscribe. Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry. Go so ahead. Aristotle. <laughs> yes, please continue. <laughs> uh, he thought that uh, most fish are just like normal animals where they have sex. And they have babies, and they uh, and he would describe the way that they had sex inaccurately, <laughs> basically saying that they did it like dogs, which is just like have you never seen a have you never seen a fish fuck? Like <laughs> obviously <laughs> not. <laughs> like Siri and I are like acting. I don't know. Yeah, like wait, where is was, yeah? What's happening? But uh, that is uh, how he described it. Um, but eels, wait for it, uh, hatch. Do not, they do not procreate like normal animals. They hatch from the bowels of the earth. And the bowels of the earth are earthworms. So he thought that earthworms were just the earth's intestines, and that when they grew up, they became eels. <laughs> it's just, I'm just like, like, oh, wait, where? Where? Right? Where did that like, come from? You were you, you physically observing the world, doing plenty of fine stuff. Yeah. Fine observations, <laughs> writing it down, but... Drama, come I feel like he was just like a baby slimy thing. Like a, a big, big slimy, slimy thing. thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and look, if you look at a bunch of earthworms, what does that look like? It looks like intestines. That must be what it is. But if you look at a fish... It does not look like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I think, I don't know. I don't know what he meant. Uh, is there a dogfish or is that a thing from dog Commander Keen? A dogfish is a shark. Oh. And in fact, interesting thing about dogfish. Huh. Uh, so like we have like a fishing economy in the United States, but they're running out of, of the fish that we eat here in the United States because they're overfished. Cape Cod, famous for its dogfish. Lobster. Crab. <laughs> I was gonna go we're, with cod. Yes, yes, yes. We're from the uh, oh Cape Cod. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was also I'm thinking like West clam Coast. chowder. Yeah. Well, yeah, oh, lobster Boston clams, all that stuff. Yes, chowder. but but yeah. cod. Um, we're out of cod though. No but idea. They can, they catch a bunch of dogfish there, but we don't eat dogfish Cape in America. Dog. So they catch all these dogfish, uh, and then they have to ship them. To like Japan and Europe, where they have like where dog where dogfish is part of the cuisine instead of them like just eating them here. So they used to just we should try they used to just it. throw them away. They used to like wow. like literally like dead already dead fish. They'd be like eh. Yeah. But now they don't now they don't catch anything else anymore. 
So they got to use. Some, they got to. They got to sell the dogfish. We should go. But we started, dog, we should particularly go in in uh, college cafeterias. They've started serving dogfish because it like you know you don't really you can't really tell. Yeah. And it's like oh there's a fish dish at the cafeteria today. Let's eat that. What is it? <laughs> they got to just call it something besides dogfish because that doesn't sound good. They you don't should call eat a dog. it Cape Cod. Cape Cod Cod. Cape Cod dogfish, but it's like we have the Cape Cod today. And then people will be like, oh, it's cod. Or they'll be no. like me and they'll think it's, it's, it's a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us here on Holy Fucking Science. Uh, Is that the end? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Thank you to all of our Patreon patrons, especially the ones that came to hang out with us during this live taping of Holy Fucking Science. Thank you to my guests. And thank you to you at home for listening and subscribing. I love you all. Except for... Aristotle. <laughs> 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 <laughs>